Thank you for coming out on, on this night in particular. Um, I think your presence here might suggest that you're political anarchists or uh, indifferent to our, our nation's future, but uh, it might also indicate that uh, you have good taste. So I uh, appreciate very much your, your company this evening. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to uh, tell you that this is a, a now permanent series at Gonzaga, uh, as long as we don't mess up. That, uh, in particular, we have to thank um, Dr. Raymond Reyes, who is here, um, the Chief Diversity Officer and Associate Academic Vice President, uh, and Father Frank Case, who is the um, Vice President for Mission here at Gonzaga. Uh, these two offices have funded this event and uh, have done so with uh, enthusiasm and commitment. So thanks very much to them. Uh, this is a, a lecture series that is uniquely Jesuit. Um, we're, we're titling this lecture series each fall, Being Religious Interreligiously. And we take that language, um, as some of our unfortunate students in my dialogue course know, we take that language from a Jesuit document written back in 1995, uh, fairly recently for some of us, actually. And in that document, they use fairly impressive language that you know, to be Christian today, to be religious today, is to be uh, interreligious, and that the Christian commandment to love one's neighbor includes uh, persons that are outside of one's tradition, uh, outside of one's group. Uh, so a real, I think, strong articulation uh, by the Jesuits of the uh, overall Catholic commitment to uh, interfaith relations. Uh, so it's, it's, I think, very appropriate that we do have uh, sponsorship from our Office of Mission here at Gonzaga. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank Jackie Fulton of our Department of Religious Studies and Pete Tormey of University Relations, uh, who helped to work behind the scenes to, to make this event happen as well. Uh, let me just take a quick moment to introduce our, our speaker, uh, Dr. Joseph Prabhu. Uh, as I was thinking of ways to introduce him, uh, unfortunately his website uh, catalogs a good portion of what he has done uh, in his career, and that makes my task very difficult because he's a very accomplished uh, philosopher. He's a very accomplished um, ethicist as well. And there's quite a bit that one could talk about in terms of what his CV actually looks like. Um, I'll just say a few things and, uh, and offer apologies for certainly leaving some things out. He was born in South India, in the city of Mangalore. Uh, he was raised in Calcutta, uh, went to school to study economics at the University of Delhi, um, then went to Germany, or was it Cambridge? No, ja no Germany. Germany. And went to uh, Cambridge, uh, and finally to Boston University, where he received his PhD in philosophy. Um, this is a sort of pedigree or a, a, a sort of line of personal experience that's, that's truly multicultural. Uh, and therefore has a lot uh, to contribute to our discussions as a university community. Um, I think in a particular way, I'd like to just comment on how his commitment uh, in philosophy as a philosopher is also rendered very practically in terms of his interfaith efforts for the parliament of the world's religions. Um, he is uh, anything but the sort of stereotypical ivory tower philosopher. Uh, this man is heavily engaged uh, on the global scene uh, in India, uh, in Melbourne, where I saw him running around um, everywhere in Melbourne during the uh, Parliament of the World's Religions a few years ago. And it wasn't because I was stalking him. He was actually, he was actually everywhere. Um, he was extraordinary, uh, extraordinary energy. And so uh, his trip here is coming at a time sandwiched between other trips that he's making. And it's, it's a delight that he's able to take his time uh, to be with us. Uh, he has studied the traditions of India, uh, and these are, uh, along with the traditions of philosophy here in the West, uh, he is comfortable with Shankara and Upanishads of India as he is with Hegel and the Gospels and the Jesuit Karl Rahner, uh, who some of you have heard of Karl Rahner, um, and if I could embarrass you for a moment, currently Joseph learned how to drive in Germany. And uh, at one point, Karl Rahner was in the passenger seat, uh, a diminutive Jesuit uh, of great stature, however. And uh, Rahner kept saying, Schneller, Schneller, uh, speed up, speed up. So uh, Joseph assures me that he drives quite fast in Los Angeles. <laughs> uh, at Cal State Los Angeles, the California State University of Los Angeles, he's a professor of philosophy, 
where he teaches courses on the introduction of philosophy, on Asian philosophies, uh, 19th and 20th century continental philosophy, uh, and is there another course that you teach as well? That's well, Gandhi. And Gandhi, yeah, yeah. of course, Gandhi. Uh, and his publications are both numerous and significant in this field, um, some of which uh, Gonzaga students have actually read uh, in uh, our Hinduism seminar, uh, your text on Gandhi. Uh, your publications, too many to mention, but they range across an array of subjects, uh, human rights, Indian and comparative philosophies, the Galen studies, uh, studies in the recently deceased Raimundo Panikkar, perhaps one of the great interfaith uh, persons of the 20th century, um, studies in post-colonialism, peace studies, and of course extensively in the uh, thought of Gandhi. Um, several edited volumes that he has uh, contributed have uh, made an impact on the field. Um, I'm thinking particularly of one that we have in our library uh, called Indian Ethics. This is the first uh, of its kind to be published here in the West. It really is filling a, a gap uh, in, in, our, in our field. Um, so quite, quite an interesting person tonight. It's, it's a pleasure to introduce him to you, uh, a man who is both <coughs> swimming with the greatest of philosophers, yet also here at the grassroots level, uh, working for interfaith causes and for peace. So please join me in welcoming Joseph Prabhu. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, John, for that extremely kind set of remarks. My mother should have heard them, you know. Uh, mothers like to hear these kinds of flattering comments. Uh, but I thank you all for, for coming, uh, given the competing uh, attractions, some of which I've heard just down the hall. Um, uh, so I can only interpret that as an act of charity on your part, uh, for, which I'm, for which I'm truly grateful. Uh, I'm also particularly encouraged by being welcomed by a bulldog as I entered the, the, the building and to see some bulldog fans here in the audience. I suppose that's everyone. So I'm not going to ask for hands to be raised. So th that, that encourages me in the remarks that I'm going to make. Uh, I have to say, John, that your initial comment, which came as a uh, pleasant surprise to me, that, that there was this 1995 um, document that said that to be religious is in the 21st century is to be interreligious, because quite independently, I have adopted that as a mantra and have been saying it for some time. Uh, and when I think about that, uh, this curious synchronicity, uh, I, I, I keep wondering about my own Jesuit past, because uh, John may or may not have told you that um, I was uh, taught by the Jesuits in Calcutta for a good 12 years, uh, and it's an education that I uh, have written about, uh, because uh, these are a remarkable group of missionaries who uh, came to India in the 19th and 20th century uh, and then gave their lives for India. Many of them uh, took Indian citizenship, uh, died uh, in, in India, uh, went around the villages collecting uh, folk tales, songs, and so on. And uh, without any doubt in my own mind, even though I've been blessed with a uh, pretty good education in Heidelberg and in Cambridge and in, in Boston, uh, I still rank my Jesuit education as the most formative influence uh, on my life. So it's a particular pleasure to be back in another Jesuit institution here in the, in the Northwest. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is um, the, the encounter of religions in a global age. And as I'm going to be covering a fair deal of ground, um, uh, I think I'll, I'll just sort of give you a, a rough map about what I'm going to say, because I'm going to approach this topic uh, really now with a very broad historical canvas, uh, and then come down to um, very specific examples and hope uh, that there is some organic connection between uh, the broad historical and cultural sweep and the uh, specific examples that I adduce. So just to give you a, a rough idea, I'm going to start with uh, a bit of uh, religious history 
Uh, and I'm glad to hear from John that uh, world religions is now one of the core courses on the Gonzaga campus because uh, I'm going to place world religions in a certain historical context, uh, which is sometimes called, and I'll explain the term, uh, the Axial Age, the first Axial Age um, from about 800 to 200 BCE. Uh, and then I'm going to, to switch to uh, what has been called, re but really in the form of a hypothesis, uh, a second Axial Age in which we are perhaps living. Uh, and uh, most of my remarks will really be focused on this second Axial Age, but in order to understand that, I've got to say a little bit about the, the first. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to talk about the encounter of religions uh, within that particular context of the second axial age in order to pick out some key features of this uh, encounter. So that's the sort of rough uh, map uh, that uh, I'm going to be uh, traversing uh, this evening with you. So, with that, let me start with um, the, the first Axial Age. The term Axial Age uh, came from uh, the German philosopher Karl Jaspers um, in a book called The Origin and Goal of History, uh, where Jaspers noticed something quite interesting, uh, namely that within the period uh, of 800 to 200 BCE, uh, the world saw some of the major religious traditions uh, uh, that have now continued for some 2,500 years since their inception. Uh, and uh, if you go to Persia, you have Zoroastrianism. Uh, if you now then go to India and to China and to uh, to Jerusalem and Israel, and then finally go west to, to Greece. In these four geographical regions, India, China, uh, the um, Middle East, and especially Israel, and um, then the uh, Greek world, the ancient Greek world, uh, you, you would notice in religious history uh, the uh, the origin and the development of some of the major religions of the world. I've already mentioned Zoroastrianism, but among the religions that you are familiar with, you have uh, Confucianism and Taoism in China. You have Hinduism, uh, or what later got to be called Hinduism, uh, but which at that time was called Vedic religion, perhaps, and the um, in India and then in China, you have the, the Chinese classics of um, Confucius and Lao Tzu. Uh, and it's all within this, this period. Uh, and uh, it's that which motivated um, Jaspers to call this an axial age, where the term axis, as you probably could guess, is a term indicating that at least from a religious historical point of view, uh, much of our sort of cultural and religious life has in one way or the other harked back to this point of origin. Uh, we have sort of spun various uh, different religious motifs and uh, trends of thought, but in the foundations were laid in this sort of axial period. So uh, I'll just very quickly, because that's not really the focus of my talk, as I've said, um, uh, I, I'm really going to focus more on the, on the second axial age. But um, if we uh, look at India, for example, um, and those of you who've taken classes on world religions would, would sort of relate to this more easily, uh, there's a, again a fairly marked change uh, which uh, religious historians uh, notice, namely that uh, a somewhat ritualistic religion which characterized the, the Vedic period in, in India. Roughly, it's very difficult to give precise historical dates uh, for religions that didn't have written uh, records, and so you really have to sort of go in terms of archaeology and other uh, sort of indices. But, but roughly within the period 
uh, the Vedic period is within sort of roughly 2000 to uh, extending to the Upanishads of about uh, 1000, 1800 or so. So, um, the, but the important point is that the, the religion of the early Vedic people was oriented around a sacrifice, which was their sort of main ritual um, observance. Uh, but, and, and, and with the sacrifice, you had various other uh, sort of tones of magic and uh, in general, a form of religious life uh, that was um, utilitarian, wanting to achieve uh, certain goals, wanting to get certain things from the gods. But that changed with the Upanishads. Uh, and again, the Upanishadic period is a fairly long period of about easily 800 to 1,000 years from the early, from the Upanishads to uh, the, the latest ones that we have. Um, and the change is a change towards a more inward, a more reflective, a more uh, sort of self-conscious uh, direction. Uh, so for example, uh, the, there's a very famous uh, utterance uh, in the Upanishads where uh, someone asks about death and what uh, really coheres uh, in the midst of all the passing incidents of life and, and, and then that raises the question of, of immortality. Uh, and the idea of an immortal soul that is uh, nonetheless rooted very deep in our psyche uh, that idea, which in, in Hinduism got the name Atman, or, and roughly translated as soul, uh, that idea signals this change of direction from a ritualistic, uh, sacrifice-oriented faith to a more reflective, inward-looking, moral, self-conscious faith. Um, and uh, the, the trend of the Upanishads then is fairly consistent in that direction where uh, people are uh, in language, I suppose, that uh, you are familiar with from St. Augustine, sort of look inwards and uh, try to find the, the meaning of their lives in their um, sort of inward search. Um, so that's the, the sort of broad, uh, R rather embarrassingly narrow or, or uh, embarrassingly shallow, I should say, sort of sketch uh, that I'm going to give you of this uh, almost 2,000 year period. But I'm just wanting to signal one important feature of that, and that is this, this more um, inward, self-reflective, uh, morally self-conscious uh, uh, tone that is quite uh, marked. Uh, the same is true in, in China, because Confucius his dates are, again, with, with, with some uh, uh, hesitation, uh, 551 to 479 BCE, and Mencius, uh, 371 to 289, uh, the writer of uh, two of the, the most famous books of learning in, in China. And again, those of you who have read these, these books realize that, that again, the idea of moral self-cultivation, building one's character uh, and uh, standing firm against the corruptions of society, that's a very marked tone in this period. Um, and then, of course, you get uh, a little later uh, the, the famous text of Lao Tzu called the Tao Te Ching, where, uh, again, you get the, the origin of, of Taoism. Uh, going in a markedly mystical direction uh, of saying that in the midst of the, the flux of life, there is a principle called the Tao, which is indefinable and unnameable, but nonetheless quite real. And the goal of, of religious life is to attune one's life in accordance with the, the Tao. Um, and uh, again, the similarity between those streams in Chinese thought 
and the streams in Indian thought that I just mentioned are fairly remarkable. Given the difference of culture, I mean, the, the Chinese, especially the Confucians, were a, a people who were very concerned with a set of observances, with ancestor worship, uh, with maintaining proper form in society, a far more, at least compared to the Upanishads, a far more outward looking and socially oriented people. But yet, even in China, you see a turn towards a more inward looking mystical uh, faith. Uh, and um, uh, whether there is some um, cross-fertilization or cross-influence, scholars are sort of still uh, debating, but uh, that's, at least for my purposes, not particularly important. What's important for me, at any rate, uh, is that you have something similar happening in China uh, as is happening in, in India, uh, and the question of influence in which direction and of what sort can be put to the, to the side. If you move further west now and, 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 and north to, to the Middle East, to, to Israel, this is the time in uh, Hebrew religious history of the later prophets. Elijah is Isaiah, uh, Elijah in the ninth century before the common era, Isaiah roughly the eighth, and Jeremiah. And again, you get, uh, as you probably are quite familiar, the strong moral exhortation of, of repentance, of um, uh, sincerity in, in examining one's, one's conscience of avoiding the corruption of, of society and of kings and monarchs. And again, the sort of very strong sort of moral tones. Uh, and finally now, again, in this you know, whistle-stop tour, uh, we come to, uh, to Greece. Uh, and this is uh, the time of the, uh, the great Greek philosopher Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Socrates, 469 to 399 BCE, Plato, 427 to 347, and Aristotle, 384 to 322 BCE. So, uh, and again, uh, I'm sure from your general education courses, uh, you would have gathered that the Socrates' famous saying uttered before the Delphic Oracle, know thyself, is uh, a, another version of the same trend, to, to know oneself and to, to not be deceived uh, by societal trends or by societal conventions, uh, but to orient oneself in terms of certain norms of truth and rightness, um, that quest uh, which Socrates set going and which certainly marked the tone of uh, ancient Greek philosophy uh, is again another parallel uh, that uh, vindicates, if you want, the thesis of Karl Jaspers that this was in fact a very special and axial period in, in religious history. Uh, what it also means to say that it, it's axial is to say that uh, if you think about it, I mean, obviously, uh, Israel is, and, and, and Judaism, uh, is the, the mother of two religions that come along later that, that draw on its scriptural and ritual roots, both Christianity and Islam, right? And uh, uh, likewise, the, um, the versions of Buddhism that develop uh, when Buddhism goes into China and, and Japan and Korea and Tibet, and then of course comes here to America, all this sort of harks back to that axial period. So uh, there is some strong plausibility in, in the validity of that thesis of uh, Karl Jaspers, though of course it's been disputed. Uh, by the way, I should say that we are fortunate, that is, scholars of religion are, are fortunate, because uh, a great scholar, American scholar, um, uh, at the University of California, Berkeley, Robert Bella, has just come out with a magisterial book called Religion in Human Evolution, where in fact he goes into great detail, 800 pages, 
of detail, uh, in a sense, vindicating the, uh, the thesis of, of Carly Aspers. And uh, those of you who are seriously interested in the sociology of religion and the history of religions uh, will, of course, be reading that at some time of your study. Uh, Bella, on the basis of very careful research done over 40 years, uh, thinks that Jaspers uh, has indeed, uh, even if he didn't have the detail when he wrote the book in 1949, uh, certainly had uh, hit upon uh, a, a quite remarkable um, uh, historical discovery. So with that, I'm going to move to our own period, uh, 1,000, um, uh, what is it? Yes, yeah, so 1,000, uh, well, 2,200 years later. Um, because people are uh, hypothesizing, and again, at this stage, because it's uh, a, a fairly new development, are hypothesizing um, that we are living in a second axial age, all right? Uh, in order, again, to give this some plausibility, this particular hypothesis that we are living within a second axial age, some uh, additional uh, force, um, just as the, the first axial age marked a change of consciousness from the pre-axial age, which was, again, I'm painting in very broad brush strokes, as you can see, pre-axial age consciousness was collective, tribal, very connected with the earth, uh, and that now shifts in the first axial period to, as I've suggested, a form of consciousness that is individual, self-reflective, not so tied to the earth, so that these shifts of consciousness have both gains and losses, because to take, for example, just this last point about the rootedness to the earth, uh, in moving, if you want, towards the heavens, moving spatially upwards, uh, many of these religions lost their, the, so the tribal uh, rootedness in, in, in the earth with, of course, the ecological consciousness and the consequences that, that we face. So uh, I'm not suggesting for a moment that uh, this shift of consciousness was uh, an unambiguous Good, I'm simply describing certain features, all right, and it's a different story then to see whether this was a change for the better or for the worse. In some respects, as I've said, it, it was uh, a different turn, but a turn that when it moved away from the, from the tribe and the community and from its rootedness in the earth, uh, also brought uh, a great deal of anxiety, a great deal of alienation, in its, in its wake. So it is a mixed blessing, but as I said, I'm not concerned in this presentation with assessing it fully, but just with giving you an idea about this important period in order to highlight that uh, we have now, perhaps according to scholars of religion, entered a new age. Uh, and that's going to be my focus for the rest of this evening. Um, this new age where, again, uh, two or three interesting things have happened uh, just to set the, set the stage. One is that with contemporary globalization, uh, which again you would have studied in various courses, um, uh, space and time become uh, intensified and so uh, one is in touch uh, immediately with developments around the world with, with just the uh, a press of a button on our computers, uh, we can get uh, information from around the, from around the world. Uh, and just that significant fact uh, highlights that religions can, can no longer live in, in isolation. They are, whether we like it or not, uh, in a global age uh, forced to interact. And the question then becomes, what's the form of this interaction going to be? Is it going to be structured? Is it going to be uh, one that is uh, planned? And, or is it going to be one that 
uh, is takes people by surprise and uh, has uh, unpleasant consequences. So one key factor is that, that makes this a uh, new form of consciousness, which is no longer individual, but global, right? Uh, when we say we now live in a global village, and when we have even car bumper stickers that say, uh, think globally and act locally, that the beginnings of that form of consciousness, uh, which again, I think is a, a, peer, um, a, a feature of our time, uh, that, uh, we are learning gradually. I mean, obviously, uh, as with all advances in consciousness, there are always reactionary movements. So again, it's not a, a simple linear curve going upwards. Uh, but on the whole, we are sort of learning what it means to be, in addition to being American citizens, to being global citizens, and what responsibility that, that, that carries. Uh, so this form of consciousness that now moves away from tribe, which was the preaxial, moves away from the individual um, and now is, is much more global, uh, is certainly one feature of this second axial age. The second feature is that, as I've said uh, a few minutes ago, um, uh, religions and religious people now are forced to interact with each other. I mean, if you, uh, I come from a city that is Los Angeles, which is one of the most diverse cities in the world, but it's, it's true even of, of Spokane. I mean, I haven't done the sort of religious work, and it'll be interesting in the discussion to see what the extent of religious diversity there is in this city. But in, in general, because of migration, because of um, labor uh, uh, flows, um, the, the world is becoming religiously diverse, all right? And uh, one of the sort of key questions of uh, social and religious life is, is how one deals with this diversity, all right? Um, and uh, so, what I'm going to call encounter, and I'll explain that in a minute, is made possible by, the, by, by this feature of globalization that now uh, we are living in a situation of great uh, and uh, unavoidable religious diversity. And uh, one of the big challenges is how do we negotiate that? How, how do we deal with that? Uh, I've chosen the, the word, the important word for my purpose are of encounter, because encounter sim, uh, signifies that, in fact, one uh, meets another uh, in a fairly serious way. It's not just a sort of casual acquaintance. Uh, a genuine encounter is, uh, a, a, if you want, a kind of dialogue where um, both parties, just to take a simple model of a dialogue, where both parties um, listen respectfully to each other, learn from each other, are perhaps even enriched by the other, challenged by the other, and all the features of a, a dialogue. So some of that is, or a lot of that, is implied in my choice of the word encounter. Religions, as I've said before when talking about the first axial age, may have traveled and may have influenced each other. There's no doubt about that. There's no doubt that, uh, for example, Buddhist ideas traveled into parts of the Middle East and people who look, for example, at the uh, Christian and Jewish scriptures have noted marked sort of Buddhist emphases and Buddhist uh, influences. But that's a different phenomenon from what I'm calling encounter, all right? So let's call that phenomenon where religions travel and do have some influence uh, on other religions. Uh, let, let's, to use a neutral term, let's just call it, let's call it religious uh, travel or, or religious um, uh, fertilization. But, but encounter signifies something much more deliberate, much more um, 
uh, challenging in many ways than uh, a more diffuse and a more broad notion of influence or fertilization. And that I'm suggesting is something that uh, the second axial age forces on us. The third feature of a second axial age is that while this encounter between religions, uh, if you want, is a kind of horizontal dimension, uh, there is also a vertical dimension in that uh, we, all religions now, have discovered uh, the ecological crisis as, as it affects them. And uh, their, uh, their, their rootedness in the earth which, as I pointed out before in connection with the first axial age, was neglected and lost for quite a long period of time. And this is a sort of recouping of that, a rediscovery of the rootedness in the earth, uh, which, if you want, provides the, um, the vertical dimension of this religious encounter. Not only are they encountering each other in terms of sort of face-to-face -face dialogue, but they also encounter each other in terms of a common threat, namely a threat that uh, the very earth that we need for our survival is in, in great danger, uh, not only because of the familiar aspects of climate change and global warming and pollution and uh, that you're familiar with and the uh, loss of fossil fuels that we need for our energy, uh, but uh, that this is uh, an immediate threat to the very survival of our species. Um, and uh, many religions uh, in the second axial age have begun to see that they share a common responsibility uh, for that. So um, the hypothesis then is that uh, because of these three features and others that I could add, there is something that is also as striking as the first axial age, all right? whether it merits the, or it has the same kind of, of force and the same kind of impact uh, on subsequent history as the first axial age, at least in my construction, uh, needs to be proved or needs to be demonstrated. I mean, we are still we are living, if you want, in the early stages of the second axial age where this global consciousness, where the idea of dialogue and encounter have become key words in our uh, vocabulary and in our sensibility. Now, all this has been a little abstract, uh, so I'm going to give you three concrete examples of um, how this global consciousness and how our living in um, a global age uh, has concretely affected uh, our religious lives and religion, broadly speaking. Uh, the first example is, I mean, and, and these three examples, if you want, are operate at, at different levels. Uh, one uh, institutional, the second, uh, broadly historical, as affecting certain, two, at least in my in this example, two religions and their shape, uh, and the third, uh, an example from uh, spiritual practice. So let me start first with the institutional example. Uh, John, in his um, uh, introductory remarks, mentioned that I uh, work. Uh, for the Parliament of the World's Religions, uh, which, again, uh, I would encourage you to uh, look up on um, the internet uh, because there's a lot of information on the website. You just go to parliamentofreligions.org and uh, you'll find uh, a lot of information. But uh, let me just say a few words about this, keeping the, the time in mind. Uh, the Parliament... Uh, the first Parliament of Religions was held in America, in Chicago, in connection with the World's Fair that was uh, celebrating Columbus's discovery of America in 1893, all right? And uh, 
scholars of American religious history uh, are fairly unanimous in uh, saying that uh, that event in 1893 changed the landscape of American religious life because America up to that point had been largely a Protestant country. Even the Catholic migrations were sort of slow in coming and then came in the later part of the 19th century and then uh, much more in the 20th century when you had Irish and the Poles and so on. But, but um, till that time, uh, largely, again, broadly speaking, America was a largely Protestant country. And um, because the, uh, the uh, architects of the first parliament in 1893 uh, wanted to open things up. Um, uh, they suggested that uh, people be invited from India and China and Japan uh, and parts of the Middle East. And uh, again, the 1893 parliament has been written up uh, quite a bit. Uh, so uh, I, I just point that out to you and it's, it's huge impact on American life. Uh, whether people were overawed by that impact or whether uh, the logistics of it just uh, took people's courage away, it took another hundred years before another parliament was uh, attempted. And that happened exactly a hundred years later, also in Chicago uh, in 1993, when you had the first modern parliament of, of religions. And this time you had about 8,000 people, uh, the world and America had changed considerably since uh, 1893, and uh, the religious diversity this time uh, was uh, far more uh, full, far more um, uh, noticeable. Uh, and uh, again, just to give you an idea about what goes on in the work of the parliament, it was at that 1993 parliament that the German theologian Hans Küng, together with many other uh, thinkers and activists, uh, thought that it was very important. I mean, he, he, here is Küng's uh, formulation of uh, the challenge that he thought uh, we faced in the 20th and, and now the 21st century. Uh, you'll see this on the parliament website. Uh, Kung, in a form of three lines, came up with an important uh, challenge. He said, there will be no peace in the world without peace among religions, first line. Second line, there will be no peace among religions unless there's dialogue among religions. And then the third line, there will be no dialogue among religions unless we find some ethical commonalities. And it was that third line, the search for ethical commonalities, that launched the many members of the parliament in a search for what's called, a, and, and again, this is available on the, on the website, and I encourage you to study it, because uh, it was in a very uh, carefully worked out uh, document called the Declaration Towards a Global Ethic. All right, it was the, at least as far as I'm aware, in the modern period, uh, the first attempt to sort of try to work out what ethical commonalities there might be between the different religions. Not just this sort of golden rule, but, but putting some more flesh to, to the golden rule of treating others as you want to be treated in terms of such values as tolerance, respect, and so on and so forth. So um, uh, that was one of the sort of key features uh, but the main goal of the parliament, and John, again, would be able to uh, vouch for this, uh, because uh, just to give you the quick history, so 1993, we had about 8,000 or 9,000 people in Chicago. Uh, then in 1999, in Cape Town, South Africa, Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela invited the parliament to come to, uh, to South Africa. And uh, this time, the emphasis was on uh, governing institutions. Uh, the, uh, there was a lot of UN representation. Uh, and the idea was that uh, while grassroots work uh, 
was tremendously important, institutions, economic, political, cultural, also need to be involved in the search for religious dialogue and ethical um, commonality. Um, so that was 1999. Then in 2004, um, the, there was a parliament in Barcelona in, in Spain uh, where I think the theme was listening to each other, healing, healing the earth. Uh, and again, a set of major problems from food and water shortage, human rights, uh, immigration, um, the uh, uh, violence towards women uh, were taken as sort of key themes for the um, seven days of the parliament. Uh, but the important point about this is that uh, these are sort of concrete uh, institutions and religious events that have in a sense, are riding the wave of this global consciousness. I mean, people are prepared to spend a whole week and uh, with save money or have communities save money to support them to come to Melbourne, Australia, which is where the last one was held, which, which, which John attended. And uh, just to get a, an idea about uh, how uh, a certain momentum is built in to this sort of global consciousness. Uh, it was interesting in Melbourne that uh, the, the, the parliament, by the way, has now become a kind of religious Olympics. Uh, people sort of compete uh, because the, to host a parliament for, on such a scale, for eight to 10,000 people for a whole week, as you can imagine, uh, takes a lot of infrastructure. And uh, the, the cost of hosting a parliament just in terms of the infrastructure alone is somewhere between eight to $10 million. So, so clearly uh, a lot of preparation and a lot of uh, planning sort of goes into this. Uh, but uh, as far as Melbourne was concerned, uh, it was interesting that the invitation to host the parliament all the way in Melbourne uh, came at the instigation of the then Australian prime minister, Kevin Rudd, who approached the parliament with a very specific but very marked problem in Australian society, namely that even after 200 years of white settlement in uh, Australia, the aboriginal people, the people of the land who were there when the white people came from England and Ireland and elsewhere to uh, Australian shores, had not been integrated into Australian society. They were still kept very much on the margins, still extremely poor, still given with problems of, you know, uh, uh, marginalization, whether it's alcohol or whether drugs or whatever the sort of social uh, concerns might be. Uh, but Kevin Rudd and obviously the Australian government supporting him felt that because the parliament had a record of bringing people together and uh, get uh, creating a space where people could talk about both their religious uh, commonalities, but also their religious differences. Uh, uh, that's important to emphasize. The parliament uh, was then invited to, to Australia to see if the indigenous people, and, and the parliament, again, to its credit, uh, brought uh, some 2,000 indigenous and native peoples from around the world, from, from Mexico, from, from this country, from Canada, or coming all the way to, to, um, uh, uh, to Melbourne. And they had, if you want, a parliament within a parliament. They had uh, their own meetings and their own convocations, and also the chance to interact with a, the others in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the Melbourne parliament. So I offer that as one example of an institution that uh, has both come out of this ethos, this, this atmosphere of a global consciousness in the religious sphere, uh, and has tried to promote that. Uh, one of the goals of the parliament is to say that it wants to create, wants to facilitate, uh, not to... Uh, come up, which uh, there are a lot of misunderstandings around that. It's, it's not at all to create a global religion, which would be rather foolish, uh, but rather to create a, a space and an environment within which religious people 
uh, or people of broadly defined, or people of, of faith, uh, because the next parliament is uh, slate, slated for Brussels uh, in Belgium in 2014. And as some of you probably know, many parts of Europe uh, would consider themselves sort of post-religious and post-Christian. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, they feel that uh, it's important that there be a, uh, a space within which uh, problems of global warming and human rights and uh, poverty and water and food shortages and so on be, be, be discussed. So the definition of faith has been broadened, not just to religious faith, but to people of deep ethical conviction uh, who feel that they should make a difference in the world. So that's my first example of this global consciousness that marks this global age. The second is um, an example from uh, Hindu, sorry, from, from Christian Buddhist dialogue, which has been going on in this country and around the world for uh, at least 60 years now. It started sometime, as, as far as I'm aware, at least in, again is in its sort of modern uh, concentrated form, um, uh, at least 60 years, if not, if not more. And uh, one of the things that people in this dialogue uh, will, uh, and, and, and they've written about it as well, is that uh, as a result of this dialogue, both religions, that is Buddhism and Christianity, uh, have felt themselves to be enriched and transformed. Uh, and the transformation is what uh, I, I just want to spend a few minutes on. Uh, because on the face of it, uh, it doesn't look as if this dialogue is going to get very far. Because as you probably know, uh, Buddhism, for, for the most part, is a non-theistic uh, religion. Uh, the notion of God is uh, either completely absent or, or quite secondary. Uh, and in some cases is even seen as a pathology, all right? Uh, so uh, in general, uh, if someone looked purely at the level of what uh, people believe in, uh, it would seem as if the atheism of many Buddhists and the theism of many Christians would not make for much of a dialogue because they seem to be sort of polar opposites. Uh, but this is exactly the point about dialogue, because what looks like a, a major um, uh, difference or, or even an opposition in the case of Buddhist Christian dialogue, and I could multiply the examples, but, but I think this will make the point. Uh, when this dialogue was uh, pushed further, uh, something quite interesting came out, all right, and I'm just going to mention one feature of what has been an extremely rich dialogue in, in many different areas of ethics and social life and so on. But the one thing that I'll highlight is that uh, Buddhism, thanks to its dialogue with Christianity, uh, felt that it needed to uh, buttress its social ethics, that Buddhism was uh, on the whole, inter on the whole, interpreted largely along individualistic lines, and that problems of society, war, poverty, human rights, etc., needed to be addressed from a religious standpoint. And they felt that they had a lot to learn from Christianity. To the to the point where a whole new school of Buddhism has come into existence that calls itself now socially engaged Buddhism. Uh, the two most, or the, the most famous uh, practitioner of socially engaged Buddhism is the Vietnamese monk who was a great friend of Thomas Merton, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, but there are many others in, uh, in, in different parts of, of Asia. Uh, Sulakshya Varaksha, Ghoshananda, and so on. But the point is that this school, as the practitioners of Buddhism will tell you themselves, came into being largely as a result of that dialogue. This entire new emphasis to an age-old religion uh, came out in this more social direction, came as a result of this, of this dialogue. And again, a fairly remarkable fact that a 2,500-year religion 
in a sense, revives at least one or, or creates a new uh, direction or a new emphasis uh, as a result of this dialogue, I think, uh, points to the fruitfulness of uh, interreligious encounter. But equally on the Christian side, there was a transformation, or at least a rediscovery, because uh, what the Buddhists taught Christians, again speaking very broadly, is a reappreciation of their contemplative traditions. All right? uh, Christianity, again, as you know, has, has a vast uh, history and a vast range of emphases. Uh, but in, in the process of its emphasis on social justice or on solidarity, um, what had not been that emphasized uh, was its contemplative tradition. And in any case, this encounter with Buddhism uh, pushed many Christians to look into their own tradition and discover uh, these, the, the, the ray of contemplative traditions. So this dialogue, my second example, uh, Christian Buddhist dialogue, has had a beneficial and transforming effect on both religions. As I say, in Buddhism, it's emphasized the social dimension which had been lacking, and on the Christian side, it um, uh, brought about a rediscovery of the contemplative tradition. And of course, uh, these days, if you uh, are uh, uh, observant of what's, what's happening in contemporary Christianity, the popularity, for example, of centering prayer, right, uh, of Thomas Keating and Christian contemplative movements. That, again, Thomas Keating will tell you himself, uh, came out of these, these dialogues. So uh, that change uh, or rediscovery, if you want, uh, is, is an example of this uh, encounter between Christians and Buddhists. The third and last example that I'll give is from um, a, uh, an Indian Christian uh, priest and theologian called Raimond Panikkar, um, who John mentioned in the introductory remarks. Uh, Panikkar was, uh, he passed away in 2010. Panikkar was the son of a Catholic, Sp Spanish Catholic mother and a, an Indian Hindu father and grew up in both traditions. Um, and then when he went to India, uh, which was in a sense part of his spiritual quest, uh, uh, then discovered uh, Hinduism. And if you go to his website, Panikkar is spelled P-A-N-I-K-K-A-R, uh, one of the sentences that, that you might see, which is, uh, has got religious scholars scratching their heads, is uh, this sentence, uh, I left Europe because for the first 36 years of his life, his education and his work was in Europe, but Panika writes, I left Europe for India as a Christian. I discovered I was a Hindu. I returned to Europe because that's where he spent the last part of his life a as a Buddhist, but here's the interesting phrase, without ever having ceased to be a Christian, All right? Now, uh, the, it's going to take too long and another lecture, another invitation perhaps to, to explain the, the sentence, but, uh, and I'm happy to talk about it in discussion, but the point for Panikkar is that uh, for him, the discovery and the encounter with Hinduism and Buddhism profoundly deepened his uh, vocation as a Christian priest and a theologian. Far from diluting it or far from threatening it, uh, Panikkar, in book after book after book, and he wrote some 60 books, uh, tries to sort of show how this encounter, in his case, with uh, Hinduism and Buddhism in particular, uh, deepened his spirituality as a Christian. And I'm going to give one example, as I mentioned, uh, Father Thomas Keating's Centering Prayer. I'm going to give one example from um, how Panikkar used uh, this idea this, this of uh, his encounters with uh, Hinduism and uh, Buddhism. 
uh, in his own spiritual life and, of course, in the lives of his students. Um, so he takes the idea of the Christian Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, which those of you who are study theology know has been much debated in uh, the Christian church as to how to uh, get across this sort of key idea that there is an inner richness and an inner relationality in the divine and that this relationality and this richness is expressed but in only one among many, many different languages of Father, Son, and Spirit, there's other languages of lover, the beloved, and the love itself, and so on and so forth. Uh, but um, Panikkar uh, thought of this in terms of uh, spirituality because he felt that uh, our, our lives uh, and the, the spiritual integrity that they express is what needs to be emphasized more than anything else. And again, to cut a, a very long discussion within, within two minutes, um, he, he interpreted the Christian idea in the Trinity uh, of the Father in, in Buddhist terms of a, a radical emptiness. And of course, in Paul's letter to the Philippians, Paul calls this kenosis, the Greek word meaning emptiness. And Panikkar interpreted Buddhism as, as having really deepened and uh, focused on this idea of emptiness uh, in its spirituality. And it's, he felt that this was something that the, uh, the symbol father could express. The, the second so-called person of the Trinity, the son, uh, Panikkar thought was uh, best expressed by historical Christianity in the incarnational uh, emphasis that uh, Jesus, a, a, as being a divine human figure, uh, expresses. Uh, and the third idea of the spirit, Panikkar interpreted in terms of Hinduism and the Hindu notion of Atman, the indwelling spirit, uh, the indwelling spirit in all of us that is no one's possession, but that all of us or each of us is an expression of um, that Panikkar thought could be most fruitfully and richly developed in terms of Advaitic Hinduism. Uh, and the point was not just to sort of in some forced way to bring these three religions together. Uh, Panikkar wanted to show that in fact uh, this encounter in his own case and, and hopefully through his life and through his writings he wanted to convey to others that this encounter uh, in his case for over 40 years or 50 years with Hinduism and, and, and Buddhism had profoundly deepened his understanding not only of the Trinity uh, but also of his own spiritual, of his own spiritual life. So uh, I'm going to end uh, very soon uh, with just if, if these three examples, one of the Parliament of the World's Religions, the second from um, uh, Christian Buddhist dialogue, and the third from Panikkar's work, give you some idea about the potential uh, challenges and potential gains to be got from religious encounter, then uh, that slogan that John began with, uh, and which this lecture is named after, being religious into relig religiously, I think has gained, I hope, a little concreteness. Thank you. So Joseph has said he looks forward to some robust, robust conversation and uh, some discussion. So if there are questions, uh, ways in which we might uh, enter a conversation. Um, yeah, I think it's it's interesting this interreligion perspective that you know, the, the examples you've shown. What are your thoughts on like the intra-religion movement, such as like the ecumenical movement, or even like Gonzaga's role, like World Youth Day and Jesuit um, education is coming together, and how if there's like such a divide within like the Christian Church, how I guess that affects unity amongst different religions. Yes, no, that's a very interesting, it's a very interesting question because uh, in, to take my own example, in the parliament of the world's religions, I have more in common with 
liberal Jews and Muslims uh, than I do with fellow Christians. I, I am myself a, a, a liberal Christian, uh, or at least that's how I think of myself. Uh, but I, uh, I can relate temperamentally and intellectually much more easily with a liberal Jew and a liberal Muslim and a liberal Buddhist uh, than with a fundamentalist uh, Christian. So um, your, your question's a very important one. Uh, and I'd say two things about it. One is, uh, well, well, maybe three things. I mean, uh, one is that the, the idea of, of dialogue is, is a very rich idea if you, if you think about it for a minute. I mean, if, if you, and you'll notice this even in a, in, a, in a meaningful dialogue with a friend, right? That external dialogue sparks off an internal dialogue. In other words, some of your beliefs, some of your perceptions get, get challenged, get, uh, and you know, make you think about that. So the external and the internal dialogue sort of go together, right? So that's the first remark. Now, this doesn't always translate into dialogue between denominations, which was what your question is within the Christian tradition. Uh, but uh, the idea of saying that, look, if uh, it, it's not as simple as that, because obviously uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, as you know, uh, family quarrels are sometimes more difficult to, to solve than uh, quarrels with, with, with relative strangers. Uh, so it, it's by no means uh, an easy task to sort of try to heal the divisions within a tradition. And, and again, these divisions are there uh, across the globe. I mean, across the globe, you're going to find fundamentalists on the one hand and liberal uh, spokespeople persons of that tradition, whether it's Islam or Judaism or whatever. And uh, from, a, from a point of view of my analysis, that's not altogether surprising because the idea of encountering someone uh, is an act of courage and carries a risk involved. And that's why the courage is required because if you, one way of thinking about it is who would not be interested at all in religious encounter or dialogue? And the answer is, well, fundamentalists. Why? Because fundamentalists are convinced, maybe out of fear, maybe out of conviction. We, we, you know, we, we, we do, there could be a variety of reasons for it. But in any case, they're convinced that they really have nothing to learn from these dialogues, but only to, to teach. Um, and of course, if that's your attitude, then you're not going to enter into a dialogue either, right? Uh, so uh, the, the, the very act of dialogue is, is an act of, of courage and of trust. And if, for, if these are lacking, then you know, it's going to be difficult to bring that about. But, but clearly, the idea of allowing within a tradition, uh, people to have different views and yet to be in sort of conversation because it, it, it's, it, it's a part of what it means to be religious that there are going to be differences and, and marked differences. So there's never going to be, and it's not even desirable, to have complete homogeneity or complete agreement. The goal should be to have differences that still remain in dialogue with each other, uh, and if necessary, agreeing to disagree. All right, so that's, that's what I'd say. The idea, I, sorry, I didn't catch that. I, I missed that again. Oh, feminist, sorry, feminist theologies. Um, well, again, that's a very rich question. Um, uh, feminist theology, again, sort of confining my attention, at least initially, for, to 
sort of Christianity, but then I'll also say something about Buddhism, uh, because feminism has made a very deep impact on, on, on Buddhism, especially Buddhism in America. Um, uh, I, I'd say two things about sort of feminist theology. I mean, that without question, if one is, uh, you know, e even halfway honest, one, one has to recognize that Christianity, like the other Abrahamic traditions, is a highly patriarchal religion. Uh, and uh, the, one of the appeals, one of the appeals, again, this is a, a, a big topic, but one of the appeals for many Westerners in a religion, let us say, like, like, like Buddhism and Hinduism, uh, is that it um, allows for feminine expressions in the way in which sort of patriarchal religions like Christianity and Islam, etc. Now, this is, uh, those of you who are scholars of Christian history know that this is an extremely vexed topic because uh, in the early church, it is fairly obvious that uh, women took an extremely important role. I mean, I'm talking now about the period immediately, let's say, after, when the first Christian communities start forming after the uh, destruction of the temple of 70 uh, AD. Uh, so uh, the, the, in these communities, there's scholars have sort of shown that women were really quite active. And so why and how women's voices got, got suppressed is, is part of what scholars of Christianity are, are sort of trying to discover. But the, the important point to move it now to the present is that uh, I think ideas of, um, uh, that feminist theology have, have brought, I mean, I, I'll give you one example, which is again, a, from my perspective, uh, one of the great contributions of uh, Christianity, the move within Christianity from transcendence to a more imminent, inward-looking, earth-oriented sort of spirituality is definitely in, in large measure due to sort of feminist influence. Uh, and uh, I would say that, it, again, if talking very, very broadly, that this has been one of the sort of great contributions. And uh, with that comes other changes that, that uh, you know, you don't necessarily need to uh, be constantly uh, defining things in, in rigid legalistic ways. There's a chance to be more dialogical and open and receptive and so on. So that's, that's the point about feminism within Christianity. Feminism within Buddhism ha has had, and this has been something that, that Buddhist scholars have, have remarked, uh, in, in California, especially in Northern California, uh, th there's a very interesting historical sociological fact. M most of the Buddhist retreat centers in Northern California, Marin County and so on, uh, are run by Jews. So there's a now a new word in the Jewish vocabulary, Jubus, all right? That is, uh, so uh, uh, it, it's a pretty remarkable fact. I mean, which uh, again, <laughs> Uh, one needs to sort of explain, and, and Jews, of course, have explained this. There's a book called The, uh, the Jew in the Lotus, um, which is, is a pun on, on a Tibetan a mantra called The Jewel in the Lotus. That's the English translation of the, uh, of the Tibetan mantra, uh, Om Pani Mandi Ham. And uh, the, the, um, uh, the other marked change in American Buddhism, which has affected world Buddhism, is that many of these same ashrams and retreat centers uh, are not only run by Jews, but they've been Jewish women. All right, and so uh, the, the idea that women could be in charge of religious institutions and well-run in institutions has fairly shaken world Buddhism, which sort of seeing the sort of spread of Buddhism has noted the fact that women in America and in the West have uh, felt empowered to, to be heads of these 
ashrams and, and retreat centers. So those are two examples where, you know, sort of feminist influences. Uh, unless your question was, was more specific about feminist theology. That is, that is the okay, all right, great. Go ahead. Um, if, if we take your hypothesis of the second axial age as true, was the first actual age a, ne did it necessarily evolve into the second axial age? And if so, um, where is that with this, that we're currently in the second axial age, what will that evolve into? <laughs> well, I, I mean, the, I, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a, a soothsayer or a, a predictor. Uh, so, uh, I mean, f f first of all, uh, as I pointed out, there is much more evidence about the first axial age because that's been studied. We have, uh, you know, the data, the, the uh, and, uh, but the, the hypothesis is, it's, and so I should say this, that the, the first axial age is, is, is as a historical generalization, uh, pretty solidly established. Uh, whether we are living in a second axial age and whether this age deserves to be called axial in the same way as the first one was, uh, that's open to question. The reason why people, some religious scholars, think, think we might be living, please note my language, we might be living in the second axial age is because there is noted, uh, and, and the great thinker here on the Catholic side is, is the Jesuit uh, Pierre Théa de Chardin, who, in a sense, in, in his books, was trying to say that if you look at uh, religious evolution, uh, there are forces of what he called planetization and convergence, all right, that indicate that at this period of our history, we are living in, again, a marked change of consciousness. So uh, I think that the more modest hypothesis is uh, the one that, that I would prefer, given how young this so-called second axial age is, that we can certainly note, thanks to forces of planetization and globalization, a change of consciousness. I mean, the idea of global consciousness is not empty. It, it does have some content to it. And the idea of, uh, multiple religious belonging, for example, like I just cited in the case of Jews running these Buddhist ashrams. Uh, so all these would not have happened, let us say, even a hundred years ago. I mean, we, we'd stay solidly within our traditions. I was telling John over dinner that, that the Luce Foundation, which has done the, the major study about religious habits in America, has found that something like 43% of people who identify themselves as religious change their religious affiliation sometime in their life, all right? So uh, that again is a marked feature in, in your parents' or grandparents' time. If you're a Catholic, you're born a Catholic, and the idea of ever sort of looking elsewhere would, would have been simply shocking. Uh, so the fact that there are now other possibilities is again a feature of a different form of consciousness. So I, I think it's probably better to, to be more modest. I, I, I did mention the second axial age as a hy possible hypothesis, uh, but it, it certainly does not have the kind of solidity and the kind of verification that the first axial age has. It, at this stage, I think if we are more precise, we would have to say we note certain changes of consciousness and certain changes of style, uh, but whether that is going to have the impact of an axial age, uh, we can't really tell at this point. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, uh, I'm not sure if you had uh, physically mentioned before, but I think it was about the, uh, yeah, about the uh, 2014 parliament, um, and I was wondering uh, about the, uh, uh, I think we were mentioning that it was post-religion. Uh, there, was, there was discussion of post-religion or right. uh, possible non-religion. Yeah. I was wondering how would you say the, um, uh, if, do you think that there's been an influence between maybe non-religious and religious uh, groups and uh, what, uh, I guess, the overall challenges of kind of the interior dialogue? Like well, again, this is a very interesting uh, question, the, the non-religious versus the religious, because again, 
uh, I'm looking at the Loose Foundation report, uh, when, when people, uh, and, and by the way, uh, the, the, the Harvard sociologist uh, uh, Putnam uh, has written a book called American Grace, which uh, documents some of these changes. So it's not just the, the Loose Foundation. American Grace is, is a very important work of, of is very factual, uh, survey-based, and, and, and so on. So it's important. Uh, for uh, at least the American uh, re religious scene. Um, uh, not only is it the case that 42% sort of change their religious affiliation, um, at least as they would describe themselves, uh, but many now fall in this category of saying, of describing themselves as spiritual but not religious, all right? Uh, and what exactly that means uh, is, of course, something that uh, religious scholars are sort of trying to tease out. Uh, I mean, the, the fact that people would not uh, consider themselves religious if he took just the, the usual barometers of that, church attendance, uh, you know, in, in, in Europe, payment of taxes, and so on and so forth, uh, I mean, we, we can attest to, and, and in Europe, certainly, the fact that the churches on Sunday and Saturday are completely empty. Uh, so, uh, at least in Northern Europe, they are. So, uh, the, um, I think there is no lack of, of evidence, but, but what spirituality means, what its commitments are, what uh, forms it takes, uh, I think is uh, sort of up in the air. And so when I mentioned uh, the new challenge that the parliament will face in 2014 is that it's being held in a country where at least according to the external landmarks, church attendance uh, and so on, uh, Europe and Belgium would sort of regard itself as post-Christian. Um, how does a religious institution like the parliament that, of, that calls itself the parliament of world religions operate with people who consider themselves post-religious? That's the challenge. One way in which the parliament has met that is to say, well, um, it's important for people who have deep ethical convictions and who care about the environment or poverty or human rights or whatever it is to get together and perhaps discuss what th their basic motivations are. I mean, in, in one case, religious, and in another case, not religious, but nonetheless. Uh, one example of that, by the way, is, is the human rights discussion, which I didn't mention today, but uh, this problem that you're mentioning sort of came up uh, when the UN document on human rights was being drafted, because uh, initially, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, who, who sort of brought the group together, said, brought people of, of religiously diverse groups. One was a Chinese Confucian scholar, another was uh, a Coptic Christian, and so on and so forth. Uh, but they quarreled among themselves so much about religious matters that Mrs. Roosevelt and others on the, on the UN committee said, no more discussion about religion, let's just talk about concrete policy, all right? And, uh, what they found was that they could agree about uh, human rights, about you know, respect for human life, non-torture, and you know, many of the other 30 articles, uh, but uh, that you could have that kind of agreement without agreeing on religious motivations. And uh, that's the similar kind of spirit that is driving the 2014 parliament. Okay. You had a question. We're going to try on time. It might be appropriate to give the Jesuit Father Clancy the final question. Um, <laughs> students have exams to study for, and we, we do want to extend some time. But uh, Father Clancy, well, I'll answer. I'll ask you a question which you probably won't be able to answer. But I hope that's the usual trick of Jesuits. I mean, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, this uh, this idea of entering a post a second axial age. Um, uh, I'm thinking of, of uh, kind of axial age religious institutions like Catholicism. Um, are they going to be able to 
to transition into the second axial age, or are the pressures going to kind of pull them apart and we're going to need some other kind of religious institution on the other side? Uh, the other side of? Of having actually made, having actually gone into the second axial age, having actually gone into this yeah. global interconnected um, dialogical world. Um, because I'm thinking that um, those axial institutions, I mean, one of the definitions is, is that they're, um, have very strong doctrinal boundaries and they're about evangelizing the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of what's not going to happen. Right. Right. Uh, well, that's again a very important question. Uh, just, just one point of clarification. Uh, Christianity does not really belong among the first axial age because that, that period is roughly 800 to 200 BCE. Christianity, you know, comes 200 years later or 300 years later. So, in a sense, uh, Judaism and, and, and late prophetic Judaism prepares the ground for, for that, but, but Christianity itself does not really you know, fit in. But, that's, uh, but, but the more important part of your question is uh, the, uh, the idea of saying that if a religion or a faith defines itself by doctrinal boundaries and as in the, uh, I mean, J John and I were talking about Dominus Jesus, the, 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 the proclamation from uh, uh, then Cardinal Ratzinger um, uh, on attitude towards, of, on the, of Christians towards, uh, towards non-Christians, uh, certainly uh, that's not a text that belongs in the second axial age. Uh, so, in a sense, people like myself who uh, are trying to promote religious dialogue uh, really have to come to terms with, uh, I'd say two things, because you're right. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, another invitation again, the second one. All right, so the, the, um, uh, one of the things I think that um, uh, dialogue might bring about, might bring about, is uh, the very definition of, and the, uh, of, of what is primary within a religion, whether it is doctrine that is primary or practices and, and, and rituals uh, that is primary. And uh, if you take, for example, the idea of, even within Catholicism, liberation theology, and you trace what its sort of central uh, dynamism was, uh, it, it's really the idea of sort of base communities, you know, that, that, that come together in solidarity against certain problems. And so a specific practice then dictated how they were going to read not only the scriptures, but also as in, you know, the, the interpretations of the Trinity, the social interpretations of the Trinity. So uh, the emphasis shifts, I think, when, when one looks at practices and communities, uh, the, the prioritizing of doctrine and dogma, uh, I think. But I, again, but to, to link this with the previous question, uh, Doctrine, in a sense, has to be there. Otherwise, the, the, there's no substance or there's no great depth to the spirituality. But it's this dialectic between practices and rituals on one hand and the, uh, the, the more doctrinal on the other. That, that dialectic is the one that I think is shifting. I think what I'm suggesting is that in the second axial age, it'll be more sort of ethical convictions and practices that drive the, the, the religions rather than their doctrines. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, please join me in thanking